Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be discussing the peritoneal cavity. I'm going to show you how we can separate the peritoneum into multiple distinct spaces and then we're going to look at some of the intra-abdominal organs that fill the peritoneum itself. I'm going to show you how to identify all of these on a CT scan as well as looking at some diagrams here to make our understanding a bit clearer. There's a lot of folding and rotating that happens in the abdomen that makes it sometimes quite difficult to know where we're dealing with or what space we're in. Hopefully by the end of this talk you'll be able to comfortably know where you are in the abdomen, which space the various organs are occupying. So let's have a look at this sagittal section through a female patient. It's obviously a schematic drawing. We've got at the top here our lung fields in, uh, represented in this orange-yellow color here. Then this green section here is our peritoneum. The peritoneum has a layer that touches the abdominal border here. This green layer wraps around our pelvic organs. We've got our uterus here, our bladder here, and the rectum posteriorly and then goes along this posterior abdominal wall here. This is all known as parietal peritoneum. It's represented by this green line here. The peritoneum also then invaginates in towards the peritoneal cavity and wraps itself around the various organs within the abdomen. And that's represented by this double orange line here that goes around the intra-abdominal organs. That's what's known as visceral peritoneum. So we've got parietal peritoneum on the outside of the abdominal wall, and as we head inwards and we wrap around the organs, that's what's known as our visceral peritoneum. Then these parts that head out towards the various organs, you can see they're a double layer. This here is our transverse colon. If you imagine the transverse colon spreading away from this parietal peritoneum, pushing through and reaching into the abdomen, it's created a double layer of peritoneum. Now a double layer of peritoneum that comes out from the um, abdominal wall and heads to a hollow viscous is what's known as mesentery. Now there are four different mesenteries within the abdomen. We've got our transverse mesocolon mesentery. We've got our small intestine mesentery. We've got our sigmoid mesentery. And we have a little bit of mesentery going for our appendix, our appendiceal mesocolon mesentery. Then peritoneum that goes from the stomach, which is represented in orange here, towards other organs such as the liver, the spleen, and our transverse colon. That is what's known as omentum. We sometimes call these ligaments. Any double fold of peritoneum, we can also call it a ligament. And here we have between our stomach and our liver, we've got our gastrohepatic ligament, or otherwise known as our lesser omentum. Then from the stomach hanging right down the front of the abdomen, folding back up, so we've got four layers of peritoneum here, going back up to the transverse colon, that's what's known as our greater omentum. So we've got lesser omentum at the top, greater omentum at the bottom. You'll see that we've got a couple of retroperitoneal structures behind the peritoneum. We've got our abdominal aorta coming here, giving off our celiac, our SMA, and our IMA. We've got a whole lecture, a whole talk on the abdominal aorta and its various branches. If you haven't checked that out, I'd highly recommend going to look at that. It really intricately matches what we're looking at here in this abdominal CT. We also have our pancreas here that wraps around. This is the unsinate process of the pancreas up to the body here, wrapping around the SMA as we're going to see in our CT scan. As well as some of the bowel is also retroperitoneal. So our second to fourth parts of the duodenum, as well as our ascending and descending colon, all are retroperitoneal structures. So we're going to have a look at a CT. The first thing I want to do is identify the various organs that fit within the abdominal cavity. Then we're going to go back to a diagram and I'm going to show you how we can separate the peritoneum into multiple different spaces and then go through another CT where I can show you how to identify those spaces. So let's start by having a look at a normal axial slice CT scan. So whenever you're looking at the abdomen on a CT scan, it's best to start in the thorax and head your way into the abdomen so you don't miss things on those uppermost portions of the abdomen. So you can see here we're in the thorax, we've got our heart centrally, we've got our right and our left lungs. The patient's front is here, anterior, posterior at the vertebral column. This is their right side and then that is their left side there. So we can scroll down into the abdomen. The first thing that we see is the top portion of the liver here. We know that our right hemidiaphragm is slightly higher than our left because our liver is occupying space within that right hemidiaphragm. So let's scroll down through the liver. What I want to do first is have a look at the gastrointestinal tract. I want to show you how you can follow it all the way from the esophagus all the way down to the rectum. 
And then we can go back up and look at various different organs within the abdomen. So we've got our liver on the right, and we can see our spleen coming in on the patient's left. And what I want to do is start at the esophagus and work my way down. So let's go down the esophagus. The esophagus is going to pierce the diaphragm. It's going to move into the stomach. We can see the stomach here. Note its relation to the liver and to the spleen. We follow the stomach. It should make this J shape around, head onto the patient's right-hand side, become the pylorus, and then into the first part of the duodenum here. You can follow with my mouse. The duodenum then, the first part, heads backwards to port towards the retroperitoneal space. You can see how it comes backwards here. This now becomes the second part of the duodenum, which heads inferiorly. So let's keep scrolling inferiorly. This part of the duodenum is now retroperitoneal. It doesn't have its own mesentery supplying it. It's just got parietal peritoneum over the front of it here. You can follow that duodenum now. It should then head across the midline of the patient. That is our third section of the duodenum and then once it's headed across it heads back up superiorly so let's scroll up superiorly we can follow that duodenum here and we should get to a turning point you see this turning point here that's what's known as our dj flexure and that's where the ligament of trites is our duodenum then the fourth part now becomes the jejunum so we can then see our jejunum here and i'm not going to follow all the small bowel loops exactly down but we can keep scrolling inferiorly and we can see that these small bowel loops coming across the abdomen and we can see these blood vessels all coming through the mesentery towards that small bowel. All of this small bowel is in the peritoneal cavity taking up the majority of the space centrally. So we can scroll all the way down. This patient doesn't have much intra-abdominal volume here. You can see all these small bowel loops and those small, small bowel loops head all the way down into the pelvis here. We can then follow the last bits of the small bowel, our ileum, follow it back up, and we should see this coming into our cecum here. We can see here the small bowel loops, follow it here, comes into this more dilated section here, our cecum, and we might be able to just see our ileocecal valve. So now that we're in our cecum, we can go and look for our appendix. We should see a small outpouching. We can see posteriorly here. If we follow this outpouching, let's see it from its root, follow it out. We can see it coming superiorly here, heading all the way up. It should be a hollow blind ending tube. Let's go up. You can see some air in it. Keep scrolling up and it should. It goes all the way up towards the liver here and it ends there. So it's quite a long append appendix. It's behind the cecum. It's a retrocecal appendix heading up towards this inferior portion of the liver. Let's follow that appendix back down to our cecum and seeing it inserting there. Let's follow the cecum up. This is now our ascending colon. I mentioned to you the ascending colon doesn't have its own mesentery. It's actually technically retroperitoneal. Although when we're doing surgery and we go into the abdomen, the ascending colon and the descending colon kind of act like intraperitoneal uh, organs, but they actually are technically retroperitoneal. They don't have that mesentery supplying them. So let's scroll upwards, follow this cecum, it's now becoming our ascending colon. That should head all the way up right into our hepatic flexure where our ascending colon then becomes our transverse colon. So here is our hepatic flexure, we should be able to follow that across now. And there is our transverse colon coming all the way across the abdomen there. Our transverse colon heads across and that, then that should also go up towards our splenic flexure before it becomes our descending colon. So let's head up superiorly. We should see this transverse colon coming higher and higher towards the spleen here. It wraps around and then we can see it come into here, the most superior portion of that transverse colon. And then it comes down into our descending colon. You can see how this is retroperitoneal. We've got our perirenal space here filled with fat and in next week's lecture I'm going to be discussing the retroperitoneum and the structures and the various fascia that runs through the retroperitoneum but we can see that this lies in the retroperitoneal space there's no separate mesentery following that um, descending colon so let's follow the descending colon all the way down and that should keep going down that patient's left hand side and eventually become our sigmoid colon which actually as we mentioned earlier has its own mesentery the sigmoid is an intraperitoneal structure so we see it coming forward here and now you can see a couple of blood vessels coming towards it it's now transitioning into the sigmoid colon those blood vessels are traveling through that sigmoid mesentery let's follow it it sometimes crosses the midline you see it crossing the midline here and then we can follow that all the way around back towards the rectum now and we can follow the rectum all the way down there to the anal canal 
Now, while we're down here, this is a female patient. Here's the rectum. Anteriorly to that is the vagina, and anteriorly to that is the bladder. This patient doesn't have a very full bladder. We can see the bladder there. As we scroll superiorly, the vagina now becomes the uterus, and we can also see fallopian tubes and ovaries there. So let's head our way now all the way back up. We've followed the gastrointestinal tract all the way down. Let's have a look quickly at the liver and the spleen. We've got the liver on the patient's right hand side here. We can see the chordate lobe, the left and right lobes of the liver. I'm not gonna go into this in detail. I've got a whole talk discussing how to segment the liver into its eight different segments. I'll link it above. Highly recommend going through that if you don't know how to separate the liver into the liver segments. And then we've got our spleen is posteriorly here. We can see it with our splenic vein and, and tortuous splenic artery coming that way. And again, if you don't know the blood supply to these organs, I've got a talk on the abdominal aorta that I'd also recommend watching if you don't know the blood supply well of the abdomen. Okay, so we've gone through a basic rundown of the abdomen on these axial CT slices. Now I'm going to show you how we can separate this peritoneum into different spaces that become clinically important and become important when we're writing reports on our CT abdomen. So here we can see our sagittal section. Now I'm going to go across into an axial section. This is the axial slice that I want to eventually look at, but I first want to talk about the foregut and how it rotates in utero. Now initially we have our foregut, midgut and hindgut supplied by our celiac, our SMA and our IMA. Our foregut has both a dorsal mesentery and a ventral mesentery. It's got peritoneal folds that come posterior and attach all the way anteriorly. Now at the level of the duodenum, this first bit of the duodenum, that ventral mesentery falls away and we only have a dorsal mesentery as I've represented up here. So if you think of this blue structure as being from the duodenum downwards, it's only got dorsal mesentery. We've got no mesentery attaching it to the front. Now this first part of the abdomen, I've got three different colors here. Anteriorly here, I've got the liver. In the middle, I've represented the stomach. And at the back here, I've represented the spleen. And what happens is that rotates 90 degrees anti-clockwise. And this, the way we're looking at it now, it's anti-clockwise 90 degrees. So the liver forms on the left-hand side of our image, would be the right-hand side of the patient, then the stomach, and then the spleen. We can see how that foregut rotates 90 degrees in this plane here. Okay, when we look at the midgut later, it's going to be rotating 90 degrees in this plane. But here we've got 90 degrees on our horizontal plane. And with that rotation, if we look at an anatomical view of the foregut, our liver is now on the left. This ventral portion of mesentery that comes across here is now the falciform ligament. Then we can see the connection between the stomach and the liver is our gastrohepatic ligament, otherwise known as the lesser omentum that we looked at before, the lesser omentum on that lesser curvature of the stomach going towards the liver. And then our gastrosplenic ligament forming here and splenorenal ligament at the back. We can see how that rotation happens. And what that does is it separates our abdomen. We can see we had a left and a right hand side of the abdomen separated. Now we've got an anterior and a posterior. This anterior side is what becomes our greater sac of the peritoneum. And this posterior side, this side represented here in front of our pancreas and behind our stomach and liver there, that's what's known as the lesser sac. So now we've divided our abdomen into a greater sac and a lesser sac. And you can see the peritoneum coming forward round like this. Behind that, that's our retroperitoneum with our kidneys, our adrenals, our aorta and our IVC as well as our pancreas coming across. You can see our vertical bodies at the back. You can have a closer look at that. Uh, you can screenshot this if you want to remember that rotation, how the liver has now become on the right hand side of the patient and the spleen has come down to the left. Now guys, I don't often ask people to like the videos or share the videos with their friends, but I've spent my whole weekend doing these diagrams. I'm not an artist by any means. I'm hearing from you all that it's really helping. So I'd really appreciate if you like the video, subscribe to the channel and maybe leave a comment below. So now we've got our sagittal section on the left and we have our axial section on the right. And you can see what I described as the lesser sac here, posterior to the stomach, is here, our lesser sac. Let me draw it in here. Our lesser sac extends from this lesser omentum here through the greater omentum here. Here's the mesentery of the transverse mesocolon. This whole section here is our lesser sac of the abdomen. All of the rest of the peritoneum, all of this here, extending this way, all of this is part of the greater sac.
We can then also divide the peritoneal cavity into the supramesocolic region above the transverse mesocolon and the inframesocolic region. So we divide it into lesser and greater sacs. That's kind of an anterior and posterior division. And then below the transverse colon, we can describe anything below that as being inframesocolic and anything above that as being supramesocolic. Now we can look at an anterior view of the abdomen. We've got our liver on the patient's right. We can see our lesser omentum coming from the lesser curvature of the stomach heading up towards the liver. We can see our gastrosplenic ligament there as well. And then we can see anteriorly this big apron of mesentery, four layers of peritoneum coming down. We're looking at this section here that's covering our small and large intestines. When you open up in surgery and you've got that big fatty apron that you can lift up, that is our greater omentum. So we've got our lesser omentum at the top, greater omentum at the bottom, going off the greater curvature of the stomach. And you remember from our abdominal aorta lecture, we've got our right and our left gastroepiploic arteries. Epiploic meaning referring to the omentum. What you can notice here as well is that our lesser omentum comes to an end here. That's where our foregut ends at the beginning of that duodenum here. And we get what's known as the free edge of the lesser omentum here. If you open up an abdomen in surgery, you can actually put your finger behind that free edge and you'd be entering the lesser sac. And you can see the free edge here heading towards the liver. So it, we actually have this lesser omentum can be called our gastrohepatic as well as our hepatoduodenal ligament here. And there's really important structures that pass through here. We've got our common bile duct, as well as our hepatic artery and our portal vein. And that opening, that epiploic foramen or our uh, epiploic foramen of Winslow, is what connects the lesser sac to the greater sac within the abdomen. They're not two distinct spaces. Fluid can track between those two spaces, and that is where it will happen. So let's take away that apron, let's lift it away, and we can see our small intestine. I told you I'm not an artist, and by this stage I've just chosen to abstractly represent the small intestine, and then our large intestine, our ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and rectum. Now we talked about a 90 degree rotation in the foregut. You can see here, if this was once a straight tube, there's now been a full rotation like this in the vertical plane, a full rotation, 270 degree rotation all the way round like that. So our jejunum, our ilium, our ascending, transverse, descending colon has rotated 270 degrees on itself. And what that has done is the mesentery that's supplying the small intestine as well as our transverse colon has also rotated. And if we think about where that mesentery is coming off the posterior surface of the patient, it follows this diagonal course here. We've then got uh, our ascending colon, which doesn't have mesentery, and then we've got a horizontal plane of mesentery coming to our transverse mesocolon like that. And so we've separated now this inframesocolic region into a right-hand side and a left-hand side. You can see on the right-hand side, this space here between the root of the mesentery of the small bowel and the ascending colon, this space here is our right inframesocolic space to the right-hand side of this ascending colon. This is what's known as our right paracolic gutter. On the left-hand side, by the descending colon, we've got our left paracolic gutter. And here, separated by this mesentery of the small intestine, is our left inframesocolic space. So we've looked at the inframesocolic space, and now we can see that these paracolic gutters head up towards the spleen and the liver, and the space between the liver and the diaphragm, that potential space, is what's known as our right subphrenic space. And the same on the left-hand side, between the spleen and the diaphragm, is our left subphrenic space. We've got a couple of potential spaces on the sagittal section. We have our rectum coming towards our uterus here. This is our rectouterine space otherwise known as the pouch of Douglas, really important because it's gravity dependent. If we were to have fluid in the abdomen here, it would fill this space here. In males, we have a rectovesicular space because there's no uterus here, just between the rectum and the bladder, and there's a single space there, the rectovesicular space. In females, we have a uterovesicular space that can form here. When the bladder gets large like that, we also have an anterior recess, which is kind of can, seen, can be seen as another space. So we've identified all of these on a schematic. Let me show you how you can see them on a CT scan.
So the way I'm going to show you these spaces is by using pathology. Normally these spaces kind of act as potential spaces. The organs are abutting against each other. And there's no real fluid in those spaces. And it's only when we develop fluid or a mass that expands those spaces is it easier to see on a CT scan. So again, let's start in the thorax and scroll our way down. We can see the liver on the patient's right. And we can see this fluid density encircling or encasing the liver here. And this is in the right subphrenic space. The same on the left hand side, there's fluid surrounding the spleen here. This is our left subphrenic space. We've got our left and our right subphrenic spaces. We scroll down inferiorly, we should see the stomach forming following that J shape towards the duodenum. And then we can see our pancreas, which we, which we know sits in the retroperitoneum. And in between the stomach and the pancreas, there's an expansion of this potential space, the lesser sac. We can see this circular mass filling that space. And this mass is within the lesser sac. I'm going to use another case to show you the greater omentum and then the spaces in the inframesocolic space. So we can see here, let's again scroll to the top of our image. Again, we've got gross ascites filling the right and left subphrenic spaces. We've got our stomach here filled with fluid. And as we scroll down, we can see on this anterior surface, we've got this mottled appearance of our omentum. And we can follow that omentum, that apron all the way down follow it down the abdomen, we can see it here hanging within the fluid that's filling the abdomen. This is what's known as a mental caking, when we've got soft tissue density deposits within the fatty omentum. Normally this should be fat like this, the density should look like this, but we've got this soft tissue density in our omentum here. And as I'll scroll up, you can see the blood vessels going towards our small bowel loops here, and this color here, this is our fluid that's filling the space. This is fat density, our mesentery going towards our small intestine. You can see those spaces are filled with fluid. Now, if we look on the coronal view, I'm going to scroll to the back of the patient here. We can actually see our inframesocolic spaces. So let's uh, scroll forward slightly. So I'm posterior at the vertebral column. We can see our kidneys here, spleen and liver. Scroll slightly forward. And what we'll see is our, our small intestine mesentery here heading out towards the small intestine. And you can remember from that diagram how the root of that small intestine mesentery divides the inframesocolic region into our right and our left inframesocolic region. So here we can see our left inframesocolic space here and our right inframesocolic space. And these spaces heading up the right and the left hand side of the patients are our paracolic gutters. It's quite easy to see that if we had, say, a splenic laceration or bleeding from the liver, we're likely to get that blood tracking down the paracolic gutters and not wrapping around the small intestine because this is the potential space or this is the space that things would communicate between the supramesocolic and the inframesocolic spaces. Now, if I head on to the last case, I'm going to go back to that normal case and I just want to show you those spaces within the pelvis. Again, we'll use an axial slice and I'm going to scroll right down to the pelvis and we can get our orientation here. So let's find the rectum, go down to the anal canal. In front of the rectum or in front of the anal canal is our vaginal canal and in front of that will be our bladder. Now this patient doesn't have a very full bladder, so it's a small bladder at the front. As we scroll superiorly, we can see the vaginal canal becoming the uterus here. And our uterus, we can see fallopian tubes and ovaries on either side, and then our rectum posteriorly. Now between the rectum and the uterus, that's our pouch of Douglas here. And between the uterus itself and our bladder, that's what's known as our uterovesicular space. And in males, it's a rectovesicular space. There's no uterus in between the two. And we'll see in, the ma in males, we'll see the seminal vesicles heading posteriorly. So it's a lot to cover. We've discussed the abdominal organs that fill the peritoneal cavity. We've seen how we can divide the peritoneal cavity into a lesser sac and a greater sac, as well as dividing it into a supramesocolic space, which has our right subphrenic, our left subphrenic, and our lesser sac filling that space, and our inframesocolic space, which has our paracolic gutters, as well as our left and right inframesocolic space. And as we head down towards the pelvis, we've got our rectovesicular space in men, or a rectouterine space, the pouch of Douglas, and the uterovesicular space in women. 
It's a lot to get your head around the rotation of the gut, but give it time when you're going through the scans. Really look for the mesentery heading out towards the small intestine, the transverse colon, the sigmoid, and the appendix, as well as looking at the potential spaces that surround the different organs. Now remember, there's only about 50 milliliters of fluid in a normal peritoneum, 50 to 75 millimeters. So we really shouldn't be seeing a lot of fluid filling the spaces. And if you see fluid, then you need to go and look for a cause, whether it be an exudative process or a transudative process. So I hope that's helped. I'd highly recommend going and watching some of the other abdominal anatomy videos. And next week, we're going to be discussing the retroperitoneum. So hopefully it'll fit all nicely together, the structures anterior to that parietal peritoneum, as well as the structures posterior to it. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture, found it useful in some way, and I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.